I'm excited that you're excited. <laughs> this is cool. So you're, this is going to be our sixth episode. We've been going since the fall. Okay. Uh, and we've done lots of different topics, but I really focus on your expertise. So you don't have to know the book at all. Okay. Um, the book was The Queen's Gambit about a girl I mentioned earlier in the 20th century who was competing in a man's world, basically, and she became a, a champion. And as I was doing research this morning and yesterday, I realized that there was a real life woman from uh, Russia, and I think I sent you the link, who um, became a champion. So this, the book kind of is influenced by the life of a real life woman. Okay. But what I want to talk to you about is the way women were perceived at this time. And I, I sent you a bunch of questions. Yep. Um, and I just want to get a better sense. And, and our audience is supposed to be teens, but we have a lot of librarians out there listening and some teachers. Um, but just to start with a very basic understanding of what women's history is like and basically what expectations we had for women back when this book was taking place about 60 years ago. How much have times changed back then? Um, what did women, um, what expectations did we have for women back then that maybe we don't have now that some of the kids out there might not understand? Okay, um, I took notes on that and I, um, I wish I had maybe spent a little bit more time, but so we're talking about the 1960s, early 1960s. Right. Um, and we are sort of also talking about this right now in women's perspectives, but there was um, a campaign that was, so in World War II, women were finally able to enjoy a little bit of financial and economic independence because they were able to take the men's jobs who were serving overseas in the war. But when men came back, there was a coordinated campaign to get women back into the home. And that was done mostly by the private sector. So companies like KitchenAid and Frigidaire and Maytag created all sorts of new enticing technology to get women back into the home to become primary caretakers. And I wrote down um, domestic goddesses. And um, in uh, The Feminine Mystique, Free Dan interviews people women who talk about this, how like many of them are college educated, not all of them that she interviewed though, because she, she covered broad swaths of women in American society, but many of them are college educated and talk about how they just find they're busy all day, but they are busy doing things that they don't like doing. And it's endless because they're taking First, they're making breakfast for their husbands and then they're cleaning up his dishes and waking the kids up and getting the kids ready to go to school. And then while the kids are at school, they're taking care of the little ones at home and they might be sewing or they might be washing clothes or they might be organizing community things. So they're busy with all these tasks, but obviously they're not fulfilled and they're um, reticent to share, to, to commiserate about this lack of fulfillment because they've been told by society and media and their own mothers even that this is what you should be happy doing so there must be something wrong with you if you're not happy taking care of five kids and cleaning up and doing dishes and cooking and um so so 60 years ago there definitely was a much more overt message to girls and women that their role was in the home and even you, you could even look at like classified ads for job postings and they would be segregated by gender. So women could not apply to certain positions and men too, men couldn't apply to become nurses or at the time secretaries. Now we would call them administrative assistants. And then I think with flight attendants, then it was called stewardesses, flight attendants were only female. And I believe they were fired when they reached 35. It could be 32 and I'll have to look that up, but they were they were just too old. It was time for them to get married and have kids, which makes me think 35 was not the age, but they were just fired. They were given roses by their employer and pack, sent some packing. <laughs> so in our, in our own professions, that's, um, so librarians of children were women, but you wouldn't run a library as a woman. A library mm -hmm. director would have been a man mm -hmm. in education, right? Mm -hmm. so. Right. So yeah, so we women did could in some ways enter the working world, but it certainly wasn't a way that they could become very economically 
um, successful on their own. And the message was definitely to be a domestic provider. So why, why and how did this change over time? Um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, give us some sense of the past 60 years, how things have changed. So I think that it changed, I think, and I'm not familiar enough with all of the counterculture of the late 60s and early 70s, but I think it changed when people like Gloria Stein and Angela Davis, and also groups fighting for racial equality, started to realize that there was a system, but that system could be questioned and it could be kind of bucked and um, people weren't gonna like it. And they're not gonna like it when you don't shave your legs and when you burn your bra and you refuse to do the dishes. And there's gonna be a lot of public pushback, but questioning the system and questioning the status quo is something that you could do. And so I think that as groups different groups began to do that. Women felt more empowered to do it as well. And that's where we start to see the wave of the second wave of feminism, where it's all about um, sexual liberation and cultural liberation too, where women feel like they can, you know, they can burn their bras and grow their body hair out and swear and smoke and, um, and question being catcalled on the street. And, um, so that there was like a collective sense of empowerment there that just sort of, I think in my understanding of it, in my perception of it, just sort of like, what's, it just kind of grew, like it snowballed and got bigger and more people joined. And so that's one of the reasons why we are where we are now. So it's funny, I often tell my, my own daughter and my students and the kids I coach about how things have changed since I was a kid. So for example, they wouldn't let kids pole vault. I was on the track team. And there was one time my sister and I wanted to do steeplechase and they said no. And she and I said, oh, we're just going to do it. Somebody got word of this and said, well, if you, if you go into the boys race, because there wasn't one for girls, um, we will disqualify your whole team. And this was just the eighties. It wasn't that long ago. So I think just in the past, well, to me, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> no, I feel the same way. I, yeah. Um, in the PBS Maker series, they do they do an interview. I think they have one episode specifically on sports, and I think it's Catherine Switzer, but I could be wrong. She was a, one of the Boston Marathon, one of the first women to run the marathon, and she said how the marathon was closed to women until the 1960s, 1966. But one of the reasons that it was closed, I don't know if this was justification for you and pole vaulting, was like the honest medical belief that a woman's uterus would fall out. Right. So, and that, that doesn't, that seems so absurd, but also not long ago. Yep. We'll have that well, we didn't study medical establishment, didn't study women. Everything was based on the study of men. It's just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's crazy. So how did we develop these ideas? My second question that I wrote to you was how did they, women's roles develop over time? How did we get the idea that this is what women should be versus this is what men should be? And that's, that's a question for a whole semester or a whole degree, I realize, but um, maybe you have a way you can sum it up for us. Um, yeah. And I think, I think what you mean by women's roles is like traditional women's roles. How did we get the idea of yeah, that? That women and, should do this and men should do that. Um, we are doing, we're doing something called the cult of domesticity right now in women's perspectives, where we're learning about the role that the industrial revolution had on the home because the industrial revolution is really what created two separate spheres where men were expected to be able to go out into the working world, which was often thought of as a, as a tough, violent, um, lewd, crude, vulgar world, and women were relegated to the home sphere. But that's not always the case. I often think about the book, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair and how um, men and women in certain industries, in certain cities, were both working in factories. But the goal was to earn enough money so that you'd eventually be able to leave the tenement building that you're living in and own a home. And then at that point, the goal would be that the female would become the domestic goddess. So while her husband is the primary um, breadwinner and earner, she would be the one who's in control of the household. So that's where we start to see um, women focus on things like the, the home aesthetic and worrying about decorations and color schemes and also sexual repression and modesty. So covering even like the legs of chairs and the legs of pianos and starting to call white meat 
white meat in birds and fowl instead of breast meat because the the home sphere was the woman's sphere. And there were kind of four ideals that women were really expected to uphold, piety, purity, domesticity, and submissiveness. And the belief was that if we can get women preoccupied with all of these things, if we can make sure that she's reading the Bible and being a good Christian woman, and we can make sure that she's submissive and taking care of the kids and taking care of the house, then maybe she won't get in her mind that she's tied to this life and that she really can't hope to do anything other than this. Because, and I don't know if this is something we'd get into in this podcast, but so much of this was tied also on her purity. And so the the idea was that she would lose her purity on her wedding night. And after that, she's kind of damaged goods. So her only ability to sustain herself is through her relationship with her husband because nobody's going to want her once she's not pure anymore. So does this go back to Victorian times? We think of repressed belief then, or is it, does it have origins further back than that? Because manufacturing and Victorian period kind of go hand in hand. Um, is that when it developed or is it even further back? Um, it's, it's likely further back. I, and somebody who has more knowledge on the history of religion probably would have better ideas about that because I think much of this is also rooted in in religious principles but when you think about when you think about homesteads prior to the industrial revolution a homestead required a heck of a lot of just labor physical labor that had to be more egalitarian than what the industrial revolution presented so your, your family's physical well-being was dependent on your garden and how much wood you chopped and the fire, keeping the fire going. So in some ways, women, at least in their home sphere, were a little bit more empowered. They certainly, in religious homes, would have been the second in command and would not have been the main decision makers. But both the men and the women in those households would be really pious, um, religion was their base and then they're taking care of their homes and then all of a sudden that from to my knowledge and somebody else might have more knowledge about this that started to switch with the industrial revolution because it became more acceptable for men to be less pious um, because they're in the working world and so they might get enticed by a brothel or by a pub and that's okay because men can give into those those um, inklings but women cannot so I think no, I think it goes back farther than the Victorian era, but I don't know that I'm qualified to give more information than that. So it's more of a religious basis, you believe? Yeah. For, okay. That's For interesting. sure. Mm-hmm. So if we're going to think about today, what do you think the disparities are that still remain? What kind of barriers still exist to women? Because a lot, a lot of kids that I come across say, oh, women can do anything. Um, but I think there are still barriers today. So yeah. I think that that's a really, that's the tough one, right? Because in theory, it seems like women and men are equal. We, we are not treated differently by the law. And there is no longer the ability for um, a company to say women cannot apply for this position or men cannot apply for this position. So I think it's difficult for people, especially young people who might not have a nuanced worldview to understand that it's much more complicated than that. And I think a lot of it is rooted in implicit bias and just the, the associations that we make about gender and how those associations are often influenced by the media that we consume and, and the gender roles that we see in our life. One of the things I do at the beginning of every semester of women's perspectives is I just list off professions. I'll say, firefighter or teacher or principal or president or banker or secretary. And I, I won't say fireman and I'll, and I won't say, um, I won't, I won't reveal gender with the title of the profession, but we just start to see how when we think of nurse, we think of young white female. And when we think of doctor, we think of older male. And so that's not to say that men can't be nurses and that women can't be doctors. It's just to say that we kind of have these implicit associations. And when people in power are trying to elevate other people to those powerful positions, if they're not aware of their own implicit biases, that trickles down. So if if we think about, a kid wrote this too, that liberty and justice for all is only true if 
everybody looks like the people who are in power. That was for a different topic, but the same is true here, that if, if institutions, private institutions, government institutions, public institutions don't have diversified leaders, then it's, it might not be that they're intentionally being sexist. It's just that they're implicitly biased to help people who remind them of themselves. And if the whole board is a bunch of dudes, then they might be high, inclined to hire a guy. So I was reading this really interesting website this morning about women in chess. And I was shocked to find out that they have an open men's chess championship international, but they still have a women's chess organization where most of the women play. And as I was reading studies, it was saying how women don't play as well as men and they're not quite sure why they're trying to study it. But one of the reasons could be that implicit bias. And then when a, a woman is sat across from a man at a, at a match, how she feels inferior because she's surrounded by men and how even the bathroom that she has to go to while the men's bathroom might be right next to where they play, she might have to hike all the way across yeah. the campus or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just little things like that, like facing stereotype threat, or when you bring up the bathroom thing, um, one of the first articles that students read is about invisible women in just architecture and engineering. The bathroom thing is a really great example of the creation of a negative feedback loop, because in a lot of places, men's and women's bathrooms have the same square footage, but um, men's bathrooms also have urinals. So men can, more men can use the bathroom at once than women can and women have clothing that needs to be taken down and often women are helping children or the elderly so it takes them longer in the bathroom and it creates this feedback loop that women are just in the bathroom gossiping and putting on makeup when that's really not the case we're just going to the bathroom but i would imagine that something like that exists in the chess world as well that another student wrote about video games and how girls are often not associated with being gamers and girl gamers are sometimes not as good as boy gamers. And she said, that's probably because the controllers are designed for men's hands, which makes total sense. Like dashboards are designed for a man's body height. So even though more men get into car crashes, more women are likely to die because things are just not designed for us. So that there probably is a lot of that going on in the world of chess. So I'm a female lefty. So I totally get that because the world is not designed for me. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so your lived experience is that all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. This is really wonderful. This is perfect. Oh, thank um, you. This is great. I love this kind of thing.